We have been doing the series, Getting to Know the Holy Spirit, and we began last week as we dived into who the Holy Spirit is. And by the grace of God, we were able to get into some understanding of his personality and uh, just getting to know him on the surface. We are going deeper this week as we dive into what I call 16 characteristics of the Holy Spirit. 16 characteristics of the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit is infinite and he is eternal. Infinite speaks to his limitless capabilities, his limitless qualities, and his limitless characteristics. Eternal speaks to his nature of existence. And when we talk about his nature of existence, we are talking where we are saying that he is without beginning and he is without ending. He is the always forever is that will be. <laughs> Let me say that again, if you didn't catch it. He is without beginning and he is without ending. He is the always forever is that will be. Hmm. I know I tie you up there in English, but let me go again a little slower. He is, he is the always, forever, is that will be. Hmm. Yes, you get it now? Glory to God. Hallelujah. The always, forever, is that will be. Yes, without beginning, without end, eternal, infinite infinitely wise, infinitely holy, infinitely present, infinitely uh, eternally wise, eternally holy, eternally present. His wisdom, his holiness, his presence, and his power are without limit, and it is everlasting, meaning that it is from age to age, lasting forever. So there is a slight difference or a slight nuance in theology between eternal and everlasting. When we say everlasting, it does not mean forever, 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 without end. Okay? Everlasting really means from age to age. Everlasting has a definitive. It's from age to age. But when we say eternal, that is without time. Everlasting has a bound of time. So that's the nuance there in really in theology. Hallelujah. So we are going to dive into the whole matter of the 16 characteristics of the Spirit of God. Now, I want to emphasize a few things before we go on. And um, I'm asking that these scriptures be put up in the chat, please, as quickly as you possibly can. He is one Holy Spirit. One Holy Spirit. He is not seven Holy Spirits or 16 Holy Spirits. No, He is one Holy Spirit. And we find that... This one Holy Spirit has seven manifestations of Himself. And each manifestation of Himself has several dimensions within it. Now, Ephesians 2.18, For through Him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. So, I'm showing you in the Scriptures where these things come from. Okay? One Spirit. Ephesians 2 verse 22 in whom you also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So that's the definitive article. The signifies one and only. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 17, But he, is, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one Spirit. Okay? 1 Corinthians 12 13, For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, or have been, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Matthew 28, 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Right? And uh, so these indicate one spirit. Now, you look further down and you'll see that 
the Holy Spirit has manifested himself in seven manifestations of that one spirit. So it's not seven spirits, but one spirit manifesting in seven different ways. And the seven here represents completion, perfection. Okay? So seven is really completion, perfection. Isaiah eleven twelve is where we begin to see <clears throat> this sevenfold manifestation in detail. It is coded in other aspects of the Torah where God instructed Moses to build certain uh, elements in the temple. And one of those emblems was the seven-branched candlestick or the menorah. The menorah is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. It is first a symbol of the Holy Spirit before it becomes a symbol of the seven types of churches. So we see in Isaiah 11, 12, 11, 2, sorry, this verse which says, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Okay. Now, when you look at this, this is where we get the seven manifestations. Number one, the spirit of the Lord, which is the center uh, piece of the menorah. Number two, and then we can go either left or right. We have the spirit of wisdom and understanding so you see the pairings these are the pairings the spirit of wisdom and understanding they are separate but they are paired together then you have the spirit of counsel and might separate but paired together and then you have the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the lord separate but paired together now i'm, I'm going to be looking at each of these in a separate lesson for you to see that each of these have dimensions of manifestations as well. I give you an example. For example, the spirit of knowledge has seven dimensions of knowledge that are within it. Uh, let me just list them for you. There is the dimension of secret. There is the dimension of future. There is the dimension of the present. There is the dimension of the past. There's the dimension of the ifs. I call it the dimension of the ifs. The things that may happen, right, or could happen. There's the dimension of the impossible. The dimension that cannot happen. The knowledge of the things that cannot happen. And then there's the dimension of the non-existent or the not known. There is a dimension called the not known. Okay? We're going to dive into these things, right? That's the seven dimensions of knowledge, which if you are now clicking in the spirit, you will understand that these are the seven dimensions of the prophetic knowledge or prophetic grace, really. So a prophet can function in one of these or more than one of these dimensions of, of knowledge as graced by the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, so you have several of those kinds of um, things that we're going to be looking at when we dive into this whole matter of the seven spirits of God. In Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 13, it also says that that is what the living being looked like. Inside the area between the living beings, there was something that looked like burning coals of fire. The fire was like small torches. So watch that now. The fire was like small torches that kept moving around the living beings. The fire glowed brightly and lightning flashed from it. I'm going to connect the dots for you. Just hold on a minute. Revelations 4 verse 5. Revelation, not Revelations. Revelation 4 verse 5. Lightning flashes and noises of thunder came from the throne. Before the throne, there were seven lamps burning, which are the seven spirits of God. So right away, you can connect Revelation 4, 5, Ezekiel 1, 13, Isaiah 11, 12. 
you can connect all of these and what do we get we get a picture of the sevenfold spirits of god or the sevenfold spirit of god let me not use spirits sevenfold spirit of god because it's one spirit seven manifestations and immediately one of the manifestation that we see concerning the spirit of god is lightning and thunder so immediately you know that one of the things that accompany the presence of the spirit of god is lightning and thunder so you can jump right back to mount sinai and what do you remember the bible says that lightning and thunder was heard on the mountain that's the manifestation of the holy spirit that's a manifestation of the holy spirit there he is a dreadful spirit and when i say dreadful i don't mean that he is out to destroy you no he's powerful all powerful glorious we can't stand the full weight of the manifestation of him we can't stand it my God, we can't. So this is just a synopsis of the one spirit that manifests in seven, seven dimensions. And the Bible speaks about that clearly. And we will go into this. We will dive into it by the grace of God. I give you another example. If we're talking about the spirit of knowledge, one of the things we're going to get into is the spirit of a sound mind. Understanding wisdom these are dimensions of knowledge okay and so you realize that can we really exhaust learning about the holy spirit the answer is no and so what you will begin to to realize now is that you now are going to begin to understand the manifestation of the spirit in your life because a lot of people think that, oh, but the, I don't have the Holy Spirit because I'm not speaking in tongues. But could it be that he's manifesting through you in a way that you have not recognized yet? So as we dive into this, I want you to begin to also think about yourself and see, okay, is he manifesting through me? In this way or in that way or in whatever way and we will get into that by the grace of God we will get into that I remember one day I was uh, we were the place I was working up by Yui me I didn't understand nothing of and I prayed I said Lord if you want me to be here please give me understanding of this thing and I felt immediately I knew which direction the oil came from. Don't ask me how, but I know. I knew that the oil came from above. And the thing fell into the middle of my head. And I felt when it dropped. And when it dropped, I felt fire move through my head. And went through my entire body. And somehow, I began to understand what was before me. Listen, the Bible says, if your earthly fathers know how to give good gifts, how much more will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? You have not because you ask not. And you do not have because you ask wrongly because you want it to fulfill your lusts stop asking for gifts can i say that and start asking for the holy spirit stop asking for gifts now and start asking for the holy spirit at some point in time you will pray for the gifts of the spirit because we are commissioned we are commanded to do so but we have been going about it wrongly we have been going about it back ways. Can I put it like that? We have been going about it upside down. We are not asking for the Holy Spirit first. 
before we are asking for gifts and power and demonstration and all of that. No, ask for the Holy Spirit first. Because when you ask for Him, let me tell you something. He will come with things that you never asked for. And you'll receive things you never knew He could give you. There are seven dimensions of manifestations. Spirit of knowledge, counsel, wisdom, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of might, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Or I would call it the spirit of worship. Okay? And the spirit of the Lord is the spirit of authority. Right? What if we, we have not been asking for the Holy Spirit? We haven't even scratched the surface of His manifestation in our life. So let's get it right, first and foremost. Let's begin to ask for Him so that He will fill us and then He will begin to manifest through us according to His will and according to His grace and according to the measure that He wants to put on our life. Hallelujah. So let's stop envying others for the manifestations we see in them. And be jealous of the manifestations that people are having. No, we want the Spirit of God to uniquely work through me. And to uniquely work through you in one of these dimensions. Or more, one or more of these dimensions of His Spirit in Isaiah 11 verse 2. Come on. One of the things that I realize is that people... Christians, I'm dealing with Christians, I'm dealing with believers. This is discipleship for God's sake. We don't know how to worship because we don't have the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So worship becomes more of a performance and an act rather than of the spirit and of truth. Remember what Jesus said? You worship me in spirit and in truth. The spirit of the fear of the Lord is what enables you to do that. Hmm? Then we have the spirit of knowledge and understanding. So many teachers, yet they have not the spirit of knowledge and understanding in their teaching. So instead of being teachers of Christ, they are really religious theologians. Who when they teach, they leave you without understanding because their teaching is not spirit led or spirit directed so you see how important it is for the holy spirit to be present in our life the spirit of might there are seven dimensions of power that the holy spirit gives my god we're gonna get into it you know i'm, I'm excited about that particular lesson but that's not for tonight we are dealing with 16 characteristics of the Holy Spirit. Now let's go into characteristic number one. The Holy Spirit is divine. Now when we speak of characteristics, we are talking about those things that uniquely belong to the Spirit of God. Those things that identify Him, His traits, His features, His attributes, His qualities. Now, tonight I guarantee you that we are going to rip apart some things that we see happening in church because tonight after tonight you will by the grace of god know whether or not this is the spirit of god or this is another spirit this is very important this teaching tonight is for your discernment very very important so i'm gonna say some things that might offend some of you but i will offend your mind so that the Spirit of God can take root in your heart. Because the Bible is, is our guidebook. The Bible is our compass for everything. Now, let's, let's go into this. When we say He is divine, this means He is God. Of God, comes from God. He is the highest form of existence there is. He is not a God. He is God, the spirit and source of our life. That's what we mean by divine. So if you're going to say that a being is divine, he has to fit this category. He has to be God, of God, comes from God, and the highest form of existence there is. 
He is God and He is Lord. Acts chapter 5 verse 3 to 4. Second Corinthians chapter 3 verse 17. Where are my people helping me with the Bible verses here? Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 5 verse 3 to 4. It's important that we read these passages tonight. We are going to let the Bible do the talking. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? While it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thy heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. So, verse 3 says, he lied to whom? The Holy Ghost. Verse 4 said, he lied to whom? God. Simple. Um, semantics of comprehension. The Holy Ghost is God. He's Lord. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 17. Please move ahead of me with the scripture so I can just run in. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 17. It says, Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Wow. It doesn't get any clearer than that. Now the Lord is that spirit. What spirit? The Holy Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord, that's one of the names of the Holy Spirit. So you can write that down ahead of time. One of the names of the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Lord. Okay? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. My God. So can we safely say then that if there is no deliverance, no freedom, no healing, no breakthroughs, going on no liberty in the church can we theorize then that the holy spirit is not there i'm just asking you based on what the bible is saying come on based on what the bible is saying it simply means the holy spirit is not there the bible says now the lord is that spirit and where the spirit of the lord is my God, Holy Spirit, come inside glory room. There is liberty. Mighty God, there is liberty. There is liberty. If the Spirit of God is in me, I have liberty. The reason why I cannot be held down by any chain is because the Holy Spirit is with me. The reason why I cannot be held down by depression is because the Holy Spirit is with me. Yes, we will have bouts of sadness and bouts of, of issues that we will face and, and emotions that will take root sometimes. But it cannot stay. Why? Because the Spirit of the Lord dwells in this temple. And because He dwells in this temple, I will have liberty. I am walking freedom. Come on now. I am walking freedom. You need to say that to yourself. You are walking freedom. Why am I saying that? Because your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So if there is liberty with me, wheresoever I go, I bring liberty. I bring freedom to people wheresoever I go. My God. He has all the attributes of the Godhead. He is eternal. That's Hebrews 9 verse 14. In theology we say he's omniscient. He's all-knowing. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 10. We say he's omnipotent. He's all-present. Psalm 139 verse 7. He's omnipresent. He's all-powerful. Psalm 104. Did I get this wrong? No, sorry. I mixed this up. Uh, all-knowing is omniscient. Sorry. And all-powerful is omnipotent. Please correct that. Let me correct that quickly. So that nobody say, Prophet, you mix up the thing. No, that are just typographical error. Let me fix it. So them no say, Prophet, you don't know where you're talking about. All right. Yes. So let's go again. Eternal. Take out our hand of it there, so. He's eternal. Good. He's all-knowing, omniscient. Ah, let me not fix this up. 
Then as you say, profit now fix it. Good. I can fix it now. We know what we are talking about. All knowing, omniscient, all present, omnipresent, all powerful, omnipotent. Psalm 104, verse 30. And all good, omnibenevolent. Psalm 25, 8, Luke 11, 13. And he is creator or source. Genesis 1, 2 to 3, Job 26, 13, Psalm 104, verse 30. Now let's see if we can read some of these scriptures. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? He is the eternal spirit. And remember what we said about eternal. The always is that forever will be. But God hath revealed unto us by his spirit, for the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. He knows all things. He's the one that searches the mind of God. Uh, Psalm 139.7 Whether shall I go from thy spirit, or where shall I flee from thy presence? He's everywhere. If you make your bed in hell, him down there. If you go up into heaven, him up there. If you go into the cave, him round there. Go underneath the waters, him down there. He is everywhere. Omnipresent. Psalm 104 verse 30. Sorry. 30. And Psalm 25, verse 8. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore will he teach sinners in the way. He is good. Right? He is good. Psalm 104. Let me get there quickly. And verse 30. It says, Thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created. And thou renewest the face of the earth. Right? He is the one who is all-powerful and who creates all things. By his spirit hath garnished the heavens, his hands has formed the crooked serpent. Yes, the Holy Spirit hand form him. Holy Spirit can deal with him. Hallelujah. The only way you can deal with this crooked serpent is through the Spirit of God. No other way. He is the one that formed him. Yes. Thou sendest forth thy... Yes. Good. And... Uh, and other scriptures that are there, you can peruse those when you have a chance. So, the first thing we know about the Spirit of God is that He's divine, He's Lord, He's God, and He has all the attributes of the Godhead that uniquely belongs to God and makes God, God. There are several more um, that we can look at, but these are the basic ones that make God, God. And sets him apart. If we should go into all of these God characteristics, we won't finish tonight. But these are the basic ones. Now, number two is that the Spirit of God is one with God. He is one with God. He is united with God. You, you cannot separate him from the Godhead. Psalm Isaiah 48, verse 16. Come ye near unto me and hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. Hmm. You see the secret thing coming up again? So it means that God can speak some things in secret also. Anyway, we will touch that another time. From the time that it was, there am I. So in other words, God is saying from time started, I was and I am. And now the Lord God and His Spirit has sent me. So He's one with God. Matthew 28 verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. He's one with God. Okay, If He wasn't one with God, His name wouldn't be here. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16. Know ye not that you are the temple of God, first and foremost, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Hmm. Now this is very interesting. You are the temple of God. But you realize the Bible didn't say Jesus dwelleth in you. It said the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. The way Jesus dwells in you 
is through the Spirit of God. Mm. That's how He dwells in you, through the Spirit of God. Number three, He has a name. And names that identify him. And we're going to go into that. Many of them. That's not for tonight. That's going to be a whole study by itself. Number four. He is the comforter. John 14 verse 16. He is the comforter. Now very interesting um, passage. John 14, verse 16. It says, And I will pray to the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Very interesting statement Jesus made. Another comforter. And he will abide with you forever this word another means someone else that is different that's what that word means okay someone else that is different and then he uses the word comforter or parakletos, which in Greek, which actually means an intercessor, a consoler, an advocate. Very interesting word Jesus used to represent the Spirit of God. Which tells me something. That if we are going to connect to the Father in prayer we need the Holy Spirit we need that paracletos there is no connecting without him any prayer that is prayed <laughs> that is not being fueled by the Spirit is prayer that is really not going anywhere is really not going anywhere and so this is why before you pray, you must invite him. Holy Spirit, I'm about to pray. Come, pray through me. Direct me in my prayers. For we know not what we ought to pray. But the Spirit of God prays through us. And the Bible tells us how. So he is the comforter. Now some translations use the word helper. He is God's help, not a maid that you boss around. Mm -mm. So you hear people praying certain ways and, and behaving certain ways as if they can just tell the Holy Spirit, go there and do this. And No, 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 no. He's not a maid you boss around. He's not a slave that you chain. He's not a genie in a bottle that you rub and conjure up. No. The Holy Spirit is God's help sent to us to comfort us, to console us, to help us to achieve what God wants. Now, some of us behave like the Holy Spirit is employed to us. No. The Holy Spirit is not employed to you nor to me. We <laughs> are really the ones employed to him he's the one that uses us we don't use him so you can't tell him when to move and when to act no you move and you act when he's ready and if you miss him you miss it what do i mean you miss what he wants to do and this brings me to the point that so many of us are not sensitive to the Holy Spirit 
and when he's around and when he wants to move because we are so much accustomed to controlling and i'm using that word very carefully because i'm going to use it in another context we are so much wanting to control how the spirit moves when he moves and in what manner he moves no he directs when he does that we're gonna get into some things later on number five he is sent in Jesus' name. John chapter 16 and verse 7. Here is what it says. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. He comes in Jesus' authority. Whoever sends you, you are in their authority. You go with their authority. So he comes to us in the authority of Jesus Christ. Why is that important? Because Jesus is really the one who became the legitimate authority to speak for the Godhead in the earth and to speak for man. To the Godhead. He is the legitimate authority. Because of his sacrifice. Nobody else can fill that role. So the Holy Spirit will not come. Except Jesus says you can. Why? Because the Godhead. Had put. A limitation on his operation in the earth. When he gave man dominion. Over the earth. He will not breach his word. But somehow, God found a way to allow His authority to be in the earth, yet not breaching the very word that He put to limit Himself. That's the God that we serve. You see, the enemy thought that He could have, He backed Him in a corner, or that God backed Himself in a corner. And then God said, Watch this. The seed of the woman shall bruise thy head, hmm? He will crush your head. You will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. He didn't understand that. You see, these are the mysteries of God. Don't think God is ever backed in a corner. Never. Anytime you feel like you're backed in a corner, get ready for the mysteries of God to unfold. Especially when God is the one that is leading you and you find yourself backed in a corner. Get ready for the mysteries of God to unfold. Now, number six, he works. The Holy Spirit is working. How does the Holy Spirit work? I'm just going to give you four of them that covers really, um, not the entirety, but I guess many aspects of his work. John chapter 14, verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. So in case we didn't know who the Comforter is, here he is, the Holy Spirit. Whom the Father will send in my name. So who send him? The Father. In whose authority? Jesus. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So how does he work? He works through teaching. That's one of the major areas of the Holy Spirit. Teaching. Teaching is not a simple thing. It's a Holy Spirit affair. It's a Holy Spirit work. So if the teacher that is teaching does not have the spirit of knowledge, wisdom and understanding, the teaching you are receiving is not Holy Spirit teaching. What you might be getting is religious education. That's very important for us to understand. The Holy Spirit is the one who teaches. How does he do this? He does this through men and women whom he has anointed. If he has not anointed the person to teach, 
for God's sake, do not teach because you will teach error. You will teach foolishness and you will make people go astray. It's a very serious business because teaching dictates behavior. And many persons who have not been taught concerning the Holy Spirit now begin to behave in manners that are now questionable. Which now brings the character of the Holy Spirit into disrepute. Because how do people see the Holy Spirit is when He begins to operate and to manifest through you. I'm not talking about spooky manifestations of demons. No, we're going to talk about those manifestations of the Spirit of God. Okay? Which is separate and apart from demonic manifestation. So that we know how do, how do I identify, how, does I, how do I identify the Spirit of God when He begins to work? Okay? So He teaches. Number two, He bears witness. John chapter 15, verse 26 and 27. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father. So watch this now. John 14 said the Father sent him. John 15 said Jesus sent him. Who sent him? So those of you who are strict on letterism will say that the Bible is confusing. No, the Bible is not confusing. This is where you have a remez, a mystery unfolding. This now shows you the unity of the Godhead, that the Holy Spirit is coming to us from the Father and from the Son. Both agreed to send the Holy Spirit. So he's not here on his own accord. And he's not here because the Father sent him and Jesus did not agree or Jesus sent him and the Father did not agree. No, 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 no. He's here because God agreed that he will come. And when I say God, I mean the Godhead. The Father agreed, the Son agreed, and the Holy Spirit also had to agree that he will come. Now, where has the Holy Spirit been for the past 2,000 years? He has been on earth. Does that mean he's not in heaven? No. He is everywhere. But he is here. This is where he is working. This is where he has been working for the past 2,000 years. So let's go on a little bit further. The spirit of truth, that's another name for the Holy Spirit, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify, he shall witness of me. Okay? He shall witness from me. That word proceeded is the word project. So in other words, he's connected to the Father and coming out from the Father to you, to me. Okay? He issue forth from the Father. Right? Now, he testifies, he witnesses, he bears record. He is the one that bears record of Jesus Christ. Very important that we understand all of this. He's the one that bears record. He's the one that witnesses concerning Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, verse 27 says, And you also shall bear witness. Uh-oh. So, watch what is happening now. For me to bear witness, for me... To be a true evangelist. For me to be a true preacher of the gospel. For me to be a true record bearer. For me to carry a true testimony. For me to carry a true report. For me to give truthful evidence of Jesus Christ. I need the Holy Spirit. I cannot give true record of the Spirit of God without the Holy Spirit present. So you shall bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Now he was speaking to his disciples here. 
But this also applies to us in the sense that once we receive the Spirit of God, we are ready to become witnesses. We are ready to become evangelists. We are ready to carry the gospel. And this gospel will be carried with power, with accuracy, with truth, with truthful record of Jesus Christ. That's very important. So one of the problems we have been having now is that we have people who have been going out to witness but they don't have the witness. I hope you, 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 you caught what I just said. We have people who have been going out to witness, but they don't have the witness. What testimony are you going to give if you do not have the one who testifies about Jesus in you. And so this is partly, the, or I'd say one of the biggest reasons why we are not seeing people responding to the gospel. Because those whom we are sending, we do not ensure that they are going with the Spirit of God. Very serious business. We don't just pick up people and send them out. You see, the Bible assumes some things concerning believers because the Bible sets forth certain standards concerning believers. One of the assumptions the Bible makes and these are not assumptions of opinion. These are assumptions of fact and truth. Is that if you are a believer, you have the Holy Spirit within you. You cannot be a believer without the Spirit of God. Because it is the Spirit of God that draws men to Christ. So the question is, if you came to Christ... By what means did you come? Who pulled you? Who pulled you to Jesus? So you find that when people say, Oh, I came to church because I wanted to be married. I came to Jesus because I wanted to marry this woman. Very soon after marriage, he will backslide. Because when the euphoria of the woman ends and her makeup is removed, Please leave my mic alone. When the euphoria of the woman has ended, the makeup is removed and the wig goes into the washing machine, then the man will begin to itch a reverse. Mm -hmm. Because what pulled him was not the Holy Spirit. This is why it's important to preach God's word, not your feelings, not your emotion, not your excitement, not your enthusiasm, not your spookiness. God's word. Because God's word is what the Holy Spirit will now use to draw men. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Faith didn't come by sight and sight by the woman's you know what. No. Mm -mm. By the word. So if we are not preaching God's word, then the Spirit has nothing to do. Mm -hmm. The Spirit has nothing to do if we're not preaching God's Word. Very important. Pastor Diana, please do not send me any private message. Thank you. You're distracting me. Now, we must bear witness. And one of the works of the Holy Spirit is that he bears witness. 
Number three is that he speaks whatever the son says. Oh my God, that, that now is very important. John 16 verse 13 to 14. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, first and foremost, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. He's not any other kind of spirit. He's not a spirit of nearly goso, or soon goso, or maybe goso, or it never goso. No, he's the spirit of truth, full stop. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. Now this is amazing. He does not speak of himself, but there is so much that is said about him. Right before our eyes. This shows you the true nature of the servanthood of the Holy Spirit or the servant nature of the Holy Spirit. He does not talk about himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, which means the Holy Spirit hears. What is he hearing? He's hearing what the Father is saying and what the Son is saying. Whatsoever he hears, that is what he shall speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me. So in other words, the works that he does are really the continuation of what Jesus would do. When Jesus said, greater works you will do because I go to the Father. What the Holy Spirit is doing is what the Son would have done if he was here. I, therefore said I, Sorry, verse 14, for he shall receive of mine and he shall show it unto you. My God, whatever the son says. So, for those of you who are prophetic people, it is biblically correct for you to say, thus saith the Lord. And it's also biblically correct for you to say, thus saith the Holy Ghost. Because it's one and the same thing. So, in the Old Testament, you see, thus saith the Lord, when the prophets are speaking. Why? Because the Holy Spirit hath not yet come to dwell among men. In the New Testament, when you look at the book of Acts going down, you see, thus saith the Holy Spirit. Because who is here now? The Spirit of God. And he's speaking what the Son is saying. So you look at the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit said. You look in the book of Revelation, here is what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Why? Because he is the one that is here in operation. So in the Old Testament, we find the Father speaking, thus saith the Lord. And remember what I said to you last week. When the Father speaks, He speaks for everyone. In the, uh, the age of Jesus Christ, the age of the Son, you see the Son speaking. You hear Him saying, You have heard that it has been said, But I say unto you, But I say unto you. Why did they have a problem with Jesus? Because He was speaking as God. That's why they had a problem. That's why they wanted to kill him. He was speaking as God. Now you come into the New Testament, the church era, and the prophets now say, and those with the prophetic gift now say, thus saith the Holy Spirit. Because who is now speaking? The Holy Ghost. So the Father speaks for everybody. The Son speaks what the Father says. And the Spirit speaks what the Son says. In other words, nobody is speaking what, uh, anything different from what anyone is saying. One Spirit, one God. Are you getting this? The Holy Spirit demonstrates power. The book of Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. Very interesting verses that we're looking at. Let me read for clarity. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, verse 36, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say, you know, 
which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. Wow. Who was with Jesus? The Holy Spirit. He was the one who was with Jesus. And the Bible said God was with him. So, this is amazing. When you look at these verses and begin to look at the record of Jesus. John said, I beheld heaven opened. And I heard the voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And I saw the Spirit of God descending upon him like a dove. That was how John knew that the Holy Spirit came on Jesus. And the Holy Spirit never left him since then. So I have a little thing I said, but if the Holy Spirit never left him, did the Holy Spirit remain on him like a dove? Who knows? That people might have seen the dove on Jesus several times we don't know but one of the ways that we even know the holy spirit was there was on the mount of transfiguration the glory that appeared the only time the spirit of god left the son was when he was on the cross when he said my god my god why art thou forsaken me that was the moment he left because jesus had to now go through that because that was his assignment now to carry. Mm, amazing. Amazing stuff. Power. Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6. Let's see what that says. Then he answered and said unto me, This is the word of the Lord. Capital L-O-R-D. Remember what I told you about that. That, that's God the Father speaking. This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Now if it's not by the might and power of Zerubbabel, then whose might and power it is going to be? The spirit of the Lord. So he is a God of power and there are so many places that we can look at that shows the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit at work. So many, so many places. And you read the New Testament from the book of Matthew right to the book of Revelation. What you are seeing is the power of the Holy Spirit at work. Amen. I just received testimonies this evening. Somebody sent me some testimonies of things that happened while we are praying, while, we, while I prayed for them here on, on Zoom. And I said, my God, this is amazing, these things that happen, um, that these people are, are, are experiencing. I didn't lay hands on them. I didn't touch them. I wasn't near them. I just spoke a word, and the Holy Spirit did the rest. Tangible evidence of change in their lives that's the holy spirit at work in power in might and he's still at work today we have the testimony that the holy spirit is with us glory be to god hallelujah we have the testimony my god that he is with us those of us who think that we have to be in the building with the prophet or with the apostle no, God has shown us in these past two years that all you need to do is believe. Speak a word in faith and God will do the rest by His Spirit. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Amen. So He's, he's demonstrating power. Hallelujah. And so that's how He's working. He's teaching. He's bearing witness. He's speaking whatever the Son says, and He's demonstrating power. I believe these four areas really capture the, the, the totality of the work of the Spirit amongst us uh, as, as church 
and as believers. And we can look at several other um, areas that he's working and doing work. One of the other areas is that he's preparing the bride of Christ to meet Jesus. That's his work. So please, when the Holy Spirit rebukes you, do not harden your heart. It's a part of the preparation process for us to meet the Savior. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Number seven. He speaks and he sees. So he, just, he not only hears, but he speaks and he sees. Let's look at some of these verses. First Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. Tonight the Bible will do the talking. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. My God. The Spirit speaks expressly. The Spirit expressly says, In the latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. Now, I want you to recognize what is going on here. Remember what I said to you earlier. And this is one of the ways that you will know if a man is truly anointed to teach the Bible. Whatever he says can be cor corroborated with the scriptures, even if he does not give a scripture to back it up when he says it. The Spirit says that there are those who are going to depart from the faith because of deceitful spirits. Other spirits have entered into our midst teaching things that are not of the Spirit. Why? Because those teachers are not anointed by the Spirit to teach. So they have to now go and get other spirits in order to bring teaching and the teachings that they are bringing has nothing to do with the truth of God's word. It sounds good. It makes you feel nice, but it is not Bible. You know it's not Bible because it does not bring any lasting change to your heart. It makes you feel good now, but tomorrow morning you're back to square one. Ten steps to do this and twenty steps to do that. And you follow all twenty-one of them. Because you add one too. And you still remain the same. But if the Spirit of God is speaking. And you believe what He is saying. There is an instant reaction in your heart. That produces the change that you are looking for. Acts chapter 13 and verse 2. The book of Acts chapter 13 and verse 2. Here's what it says. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Remember, I'm showing you that he speaks. Now, how do I know that the Holy Spirit is speaking? Do I hear a voice from over yonder that come through the speaker or that comes through the chair? No. He speaks through believers. He speaks through believers. And this is why we must now begin to discern the Holy Spirit so that when he begins to speak through the believers, whether it is casual conversation or through preaching or prophesying, we can tell that the Holy Spirit is speaking. How did these men know? We're talking about these prophets. Prophet Barnabas, Prophet Simeon, Prophet Niger, Prophet Lucius, Prophet Manahen, um, and Prophet Saul. All prophets, all of them. So they, they trusted the Spirit of God in each one of them. And they knew when the Holy Spirit spoke. Set apart for me, Barnabas and Saul. The time has come for them to be separated unto their own apostolic work. And this is where, 
in Acts chapter 13 verse 2, Saul became known as Apostle Paul. Before this, Paul was teaching and evangelizing and prophesying. At this point, the Holy Spirit elevated him into the apostolic office. And it was confirmed by the presbytery of the prophets that were present in the church while they were praying unto God and fasting. Very important stuff that we see here. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost says, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Now, do you see what I said to you? That in the New Testament, you will see more, you will, you will not see thus saith the Lord. You will see the Spirit of the Lord says, or the Holy Spirit says, because he's the one now that is speaking what the Son says in his ears. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 2. While they behold your chaste conversation. Is that the correct verse? Let me see. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Okay. Now we are going to look at the whole matter of him seeing. It's First Peter 3 verse 12. Sorry, not verse 2. Verse 12, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So here we have it now. The Holy Spirit doesn't only speak, but he also sees. He speaks, he sees, he hears. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. He's seeing you. He knows what you're doing at every moment in time. You can't hide from him. We can't hide from him at no point in time. You can hide from me. You can't hide from the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. So repent quickly before he exposes your sin to the public. All right. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. He knows what is happening. Don't fret yourself. Don't worry yourself. Don't be too overly concerned. God knows what is going on. He knows it is going to happen before you saw it. He is the spirit of prophecy. He knows the future. So don't be perturbed. Jesus' church will not be destroyed. The Holy Spirit who created the heavens and the earth and terraformed the earth for life is here preparing the bride of Christ to meet Jesus. He's not going to fail. <laughs> he is not going to fail. And so I can be at peace. The Holy Spirit will not fail to prepare me to meet Jesus. I am determined in my heart to see him. And the Holy Spirit is determined in his spirit to prepare me to meet him. Hmm. <laughs> He will not fail. Glory be to God, he will not fail. Hallelujah. So don't be too overly concerned about things that belong to the Holy Spirit. Be at peace. The church of Jesus Christ will not fail. Hallelujah. So he speaks and he sees. Okay? Now, we have other verses like Luke chapter 2 verse 26. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost. So, the Holy Spirit is the one who sees, speaks, and reveals. We have John 16, 13. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. Acts 8, 29. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Now, this is very important. I want you to see this. Philip never heard a thus saith the Lord, or thus saith the Holy Ghost, from somebody else. You see, we are, we are comfortable in hearing God through others. 
But what about hearing God for yourself? Now that's another level. Hmm? That's another level. That's the level I want us to reach. Where we can hear God for ourselves. So that when somebody is speaking and saying, Thus saith the Lord, you will know if it is the Lord because you are accustomed to hearing Him. So one of the prayers you need to pray is, Holy Spirit, let me hear you for myself. That's not a bad prayer. That's a good prayer. That's a prayer you need to pray. Holy Spirit, let me hear you for myself. Let me learn your voice. Let me know how you speak. Philip heard the Spirit said to him, Go hear some. And you know the rest of the story. The Ethiopian eunuch situation. And because of that Ethiopian eunuch connection, Ethiopia received the gospel of Jesus Christ. Wow. One Spirit. Acts chapter 10, verse 19 and 20. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said to him, My God, this is a level that I, I want us to reach. I want to reach this level. The Spirit said unto me that I have this kind of relationship with the Spirit, that He can speak to me in a manner that I can hear, that I can discern, that I can know, and that I can understand that this is the Holy Spirit, not some voice in my head. This is the Holy Spirit speaking to me behold three men seek you arise and get down and go with them doubting nothing for i have sent them so before the three men came peter knew that they were coming my god and he didn't miss it because he heard the voice of the spirit the bible didn't say peter was fasting he never said he was praying but he was in a position to hear the Holy Ghost. May we always be in that position to hear the Spirit whenever he's ready to speak. Because one of the issues that I see happening to believers is that the Holy Spirit wants to speak, is speaking, but we are not in position to hear him speak. Either because we are in the wrong place, combat with too many things, having the cares of the world drowning us, and all kinds of things going on with us. We are not in position, we are not in place, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, to hear the Spirit speak. So the Bible says something. It says, walk in the Spirit, live in the Spirit, so that you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh very important because once we begin to walk and live in the spirit and the bible tells us how to do that then we will be in position to constantly be hearing the spirit of god when he's speaking whether directly to us or through others or in some other means and we're going to be looking at ways he speaks in one of these lessons Acts chapter 11 and verse 12. Sorry, Acts chapter 13 and verse 2. Sorry, we just dealt with that just a while ago. In Acts chapter 21. Okay, let me leave that for now. Yes, let me, let me get into that. Acts chapter 21 verse 11. He came to us and borrowed Paul's belt. This was a prophet. He used it to tie his own hands and feet and said, The Holy Spirit tells me this is how the Jews in Jerusalem. So the prophet was able to hear the Holy Spirit speaking to him about what will happen to Paul. Right? Revelations, Revelation 2 verse 7 and 11. Everyone who hears this should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. The Holy Spirit is speaking to his church. The Holy Spirit has something to say to his church and to the churches and to the dispensations of the churches. 
So just for a little nugget here, the seven letters represent seven dispensations of the church. Number one, the seven letters represent seven types of churches. Number two, the seven letters represent seven messages from Jesus to the churches. Number three, the seven letters represent the seven types of believers that we can find in the church. And the Spirit of God has something to say to each dispensation of the church, to each type of church, to each church as a unit, and to each believer in that church. The Holy Spirit has something to say. Hallelujah. Number eight, the Holy Spirit chooses. He chooses. Mm -hmm. He has discretion in what he does and the choices that he makes. Now, when you look at this, in Acts chapter 13, verse 2, we just read that. It was the Holy Spirit that made the choice to elevate Barnabas to the apostolic office and to elevate Paul to the apostolic office. The Holy Spirit made that choice. It was not a vote. It wasn't because the, decided, the apostles loved them more than any other. It wasn't because the church convened a quorum and made a decision. It was the Holy Spirit who said it. And this is one of the problems we are having today. People are being elevated into the offices of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit did not elevate them into it. Yes, Brother Cavell, because them tides big. Mm -hmm. All kinds of reasons why people are being elevated into the offices of Jesus. Accepting the Holy Spirit saying it. Listen, you cannot conjure up this thing. You can't. Here is one of the ways you are going to know if the Holy Spirit truly spoke. People who do not know you. Who carry the Spirit of God. Will speak the very same thing that people who know you have spoken. Concerning what the Holy Spirit has said. You will get confirmation. Somewhere, somehow, someplace, at some time. And this is one of the problems we're having in the church. People are being elevated to offices that the Holy Spirit did not elevate them into. Now you will say to me, but prophet, how do I know that the Holy Spirit has elevated somebody? Let me take you to the other passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And verse 11. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. If the Holy Spirit is elevating a man, you will know because the gifts of the Spirit will be present in him. You can't fake that. You can't fake it. You can fake wear the title, but you can't fake the gift. Because when the gift is ready, or when it is demanded of the office that you sit in, and you cannot produce it, it is evidence you were not elevated into it. Hmm, challenge me on that one. Too many self-appointed prophets, self-appointed apostles, self-appointed pastors, self-appointed teachers, self-appointed evangelists. In fact, the title of evangelist is not kosher in the church. It's one of those offices that you are 
placed into before they elevate you into something else. No, we don't play around with the offices of Jesus like that. Mm -mm. We don't play around with the offices of Jesus. The office of the evangelist is an office of power. It's an office of miracles. For you to be called an evangelist, the gift of miracles must be with you. That's one of the primary gifts of the office of the evangelist. The gift of miracles. When you go out, demons must be running out. Because the gospel brings liberation. So people are being elevated into the office without the gifts. The gifts must be there first. Before the elevation into the office. And you don't elevate somebody into an office because you think they are supposed to be in there. No, the Holy Spirit must say. And how do I know the Holy Spirit is saying? He speaks through trusted voices. Voices that are legitimate, who have a track record of when they speak. There is evidence of the veracity of what they have said. It's not some fly by night, this is how I feel about you. No. The gifts must be present. And if he is going to elevate you, and you don't have the gifts for that elevation. The gifts are added to you. So it's not a matter of, oh, I think I should be an apostle or I think I should be a prophet. No, 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 no. Did the Holy Ghost choose you to be that? If you said to me, oh, God has called me to go into ministry. Okay, question number one. What did he call you to be? Say, okay, prophet, he has called me to be this. Okay, very good. You're not yet ready for the office because you have to go through training and preparation before elevation. It's a calling, not an appointment. <laughs> So when he's ready, he will choose you at the time that he wants, at the moment he wants, wherever he wants. We have to stop this nonsense. You don't call people something because you think that this is what they are supposed to be. No. Mm -mm. This is where the mess is happening because we are elevating people who are immature. People who are not yet matured, in, they are not even discipled for God's sake. There's no element of discipleship that they have gone through. But they are prophets. But they are apostles. Really? No, 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 no. The Holy Spirit chooses. Number nine. He's the author of the scripture. Acts chapter 1 verse 16. Brothers, the scriptures had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the author of the scripture. Acts 28 verse 25. Let's go again. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul and made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through the prophet Isaiah. How did the, 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 the writer of Luke know this? How did the apostle know this? Because the Holy Spirit had it penned. He's the author of the scripture. Acts 8 verse 29 
and the spirit said to Philip, okay, go and join the chariot over there. Is the Holy Spirit statement this? And his statement is penned as scripture. Mark chapter 13, verse 11. And when you, they bring you to trial and deliver you, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given to you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And there are many other verses that we could go into. He's the one who authors the scriptures. So the word of God is not some mere word that you trifle and treat with disdain and handle foolishly. No. This Bible is given to us by the Spirit of God. Given to us, Timothy said, for our learning, for our rebuke, for our correction, for our training in righteousness. Number 10, he is the witness. He is the witness. 1 John 5 verse 7 to 8, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. So here is full proof, solid proof of the Trinity and the unity of the Godhead. And these three, and there are three that bear witness in the earth. The Spirit, first and foremost. The water, second. And the blood. Okay? And these three agree in one. The Spirit, which is the God element. The water, which is baptism. And the blood, which is sanctification, consecration, justification. These three agree in one john 15 26 but when the comforter is come whom i will send unto you even the spirit of truth which proceed from the father he shall testify of me he shall be a record he shall give um testimony witness of me all right he's the one that speaks about the father so he can tell us really and truly is this work of god or not is this person of god or not is this person that claims to be of God, of God, yea or nay? Is this work of God, yea or nay? He will tell us all of these things. Number 11, he does not tolerate sin. Genesis 6 verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. Very serious things were going on in Genesis 6.3. Not getting into that tonight. But it tells us that he does not tolerate sin. Wherever sin is present, he rebukes it. He convicts you of it. But if you decide to remain in it, he's gone. He's not staying. Let's go a little bit further. The Holy Spirit has emotional qualities. Number 12, he can be grieved. Mm -hmm. We can grieve him. Isaiah chapter 63. Yes, Isaiah 63 and verse 10. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore he turned to be their enemy and himself fought against them. Do you see that? <laughs> Let me give you a news flash. Some of the things that some Christians are facing is not the devil. It is the Holy Spirit fighting them because they have grieved him. <laughs> Bible, not me saying it, Bible. Rebellion will cause the Holy Spirit to become your enemy. 
Why? Because rebellion is like witchcraft and stubbornness like idolatry. And if you rebel, you are saying that there is another God. And if there is another God, then God will contend with that God. So really and truly what is going on is that there is a contending, a wrestling, a match going on to prove whether or not you are God because you have rejected his instruction. And the only way you can reject his instruction is because you are greater than him. Okay, you are greater than me. Let's prove it. So this now becomes a contention between you and the Holy Ghost. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. We will get into this. I'm just giving you some characteristics, but we're going to get into all of these things. How do I grieve the Holy Spirit? We're going to get into that deeply. He's joyful. He's a joyful spirit. Acts chapter 13 and verse 52. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. Oh my God. How can you say you are filled with the Holy Spirit but you look like sourpuss? How can you say that? Where is the joy of the Lord in you? Where is the, the happiness that exudes from you? I don't need anything to be happy because the Holy Spirit is in me. If you need something to be happy, you're of the world. You're not of the kingdom of God. You have not yet entered the kingdom. The Spirit of God has not yet taken you over. The joy of the Lord is my strength the joy of the lord is not a thing the joy of the lord is a person so if your joy is being affected check your relationship with the spirit check your 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 your, your relationship with the holy ghost Some of us have been in some, in some churches that they don't laugh at all. Everything is straight and stiff like the two before. No Holy Spirit inside there. No human, nothing. No joy of Jesus, no joy of the Holy Spirit, no Holy Spirit, full stop. Everything is so serious that even you are more serious than the grave itself. How can you be more serious than the grave? Jesus overcome the grave. Mm -hmm. Jesus overcome the grave, man. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I shall not die, but I shall live. Thank you, Jesus. You might go through one or two things, but it must never steal your joy. What shall separate me from the love of God? Shall persecution, shall tribulation, shall distress, shall famine, shall nakedness, shall sword? Nay, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. Come on, you, you have to, you have, we have to cultivate what God has given to us. My God, it is time we stop look like sourpuss Christians. No man, enough is enough now. Our joy is in the Lord, not in a house, not in a car, not in a man, not in a woman, not in food, not in money, not in a job, not in a career, not in traveling to a country, not in going on a vacation. 
not in sleeping, not in sex. Our joy is in the Lord. Full stop. If you have no joy, come let me take you into the deliverance room. Because one demon is inside of you that needs to come out so that you can receive the Holy Ghost. I am not joking when I say that. Enough is enough. We have been baptizing some demons in our lives and calling them Holy Spirit and presenting it as if it's the character of God. The devil is a liar. The Lord, the Lord rebuked that wickedness. It is time for us to truly carry the Spirit of God in our life. You listen to too many empowerment speeches, man. It is time for you to listen to the Bible and receive the spirit of truth and the spirit of God, which is the spirit of joy. He is joyful. He makes me dance. He makes me praise. He makes me laugh. My God, sometimes I laugh to myself. Mighty God of Daniel, the Holy Ghost is inside of me bringing out some laughter. Mighty God. Some of you, I put up the thing and some of you don't even laugh yet. When I did the little thing I put up eh, eh, there that should trigger something inside of you. Some of you don't even laugh yet. You're wondering why prophet is being so unholy. No, I'm not unholy, man. Mm -mm. It's not, it's not unholiness. It's humor. The Holy Spirit is humorous too, you know. Mm -hmm. It's very humorous. He's serious, but he's also humorous. He gives jokes too. Yes, he makes us laugh. Where is your joy? You need to ask that question. Where is your joy? Who stole your joy? Miss Matty? Because she stepped on your toe? Come on. One toe step make you lose your joy? So then suppose she did box your solid. What would happen? Eh? If you got that nice solid box across your jaw corner, what, what would happen? You and your whole generation would lose your joy? Come on, man. The joy of the Lord. He's our strength. Hallelujah. Amen. You're too easily offended. Fleshly offense. And not righteous indignation. God, we're going to fix some things tonight. Hallelujah. Amen. Number 13. He can be offended. He can be offended. How do you offend him? You offend him by resisting him. And these are also part, um, some of the ways that you grieve him. All right? So he can be offended. He can be offended by you resisting him. Book of Acts chapter 7 verse 51. You stiff-necked. <laughs> hey, let me make the Bible talk now. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do you. Mm -hmm. He can be resisted. And if you resist him, you offend him. And if you are resisting him, he said you are stiff naked and uncircumcised. Oh boy. Oh boy. The Holy Spirit has a way with words. Oh boy. Mm -hmm. Yes. So those of you who say that the Holy Spirit will not speak like that. Hmm. Okay. Seem like you never read Acts 7 verse 51. Seem like you never read where Jesus said you white was sepulchers full of dead men's bones. Seem like you never read some things in the Bible. He has a way of rebuking people, you know. He can be insulted. You can insult the Holy Spirit. And insulting him does offend him. Acts 10 29. Of how much sore a punishment suppose he shall he be thought worthy. Who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of God. Insult to the Spirit of God. He can be insulted. You can insult him, especially when he is bringing Jesus to you. Especially when he's rebuking you, correcting you, so that you can become more like Christ Jesus. And you're resisting that. You're rejecting that. That's an insult to the Holy Spirit. It's an insult to the Holy Spirit when He's speaking to you and you don't want to hear what He has to say. 
That's an insult. Acts chapter 5 verse 3, he can be lied to. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land? He can be lied to. Have you been lying to the Holy Ghost? If you're lying to him, insulting him, resisting him, you're offending him. And if you offend the Holy Spirit, you're going to become his enemy. I don't want the spirit of power to become my enemy. Mm -mm. How can you fight the Holy Ghost? You can't fight him. If he declares war against you, God help you. In fact, there's no one to help you because it's God declaring war. Hmm. Help us, Lord. Number 14. We're talking about his characteristics, his traits. He loves us and he fellowships with us. Romans 15, 30. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit. Hey, my God that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. When you pray for somebody, it's the love of the Spirit at work. Mm. He loves us. That's why he will move people to pray for us. So when the Holy Spirit brings somebody across your mind, it's not for you to call them and say, you know, see, you just run across my mind. No, me never run across your mind. Me did the right here, so, and you did the right over there, so. If me run across your mind, your mind mash up. Because my steps, them heavy. But the reason why you came across, I came across your mind, is because the Holy Spirit loves me and wants you to pray for me in the Spirit. So stop calling me and tell me, say, I run cross, I don't run cross your mind. It was the Holy Spirit who did. So before you call me, just pray for me. Because I'm going to ask you, did you pray for me? And what did you pray? So that I can come into agreement with your Holy Spirit led prayer. Hmm? Glory to God. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion, the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. My God, it's not just brethren that we fellowship with. We also fellowship with the Spirit of God. Mm. My God. We also fellowship with the Spirit of God. I remember one night in Mandeville, sleeping, and this feminine voice called me. The voice sounded like a woman. That's why I said it's feminine. And the hand touched me and said, Bernard, wake up. It's time to pray. Wake up. It's time to pray. And I turned around and gave my wife one slap and said to her, Why you wake me up? Why you not leave me alone? And she said to me, I did not trouble you. Don't you see me in my deep sleep? Why you wake me up for? And then suddenly I realized that the Holy Spirit sent an angel to come and wake me up because he was waiting for me in the prayer room. When I got to the prayer room, I felt the presence of God so strong. I stayed in that prayer room from 3 a.m. till about midday the next day. 3 a.m. in the morning till about midday the, the, the same day, not, not the next day. That's how much the Holy Spirit constrained me inside of that prayer room. Fellowship with the Holy Ghost. And all I was doing was just worshipping God. And just being inside there with the Spirit of God. And when he was done with me, he released me and let me go. 
Oh, that the Spirit of God will fellowship with us and us with the Spirit. I remember Pastor Diana told me a story. She said she was praying and she said, Lord, I want you to touch me. I don't want no imaginary touch. I don't want no feeling touch. I want a touch. And she said a hand came and just touched her. And she felt it. Fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Do you know one of the reasons why you believers get miserable? Why we get miserable? Is because we stay away from the place of prayer. Anytime you start getting miserable as a believer, go into prayer. Is the Holy Ghost fighting you. He's telling you that I miss you. I want to fellowship with you. You have been away from me for too long. Why do I say this? Because believers don't get miserable. Why? Because we have the joy of the Lord. So anytime miserableness start come, you have been away from the Holy Ghost for too long. I bet you never heard that before. Try it. You will see. Experience teaches wisdom. Fellowship with the Spirit. Holy Spirit, fellowship with me. Holy Spirit, let me fellowship with you. He's here. But he will not go where he's not invited. That's how diplomatic the Holy Ghost is. He's a gentleman, not a spooky man, not a boogeyman. <laughs> a gentleman. He goes where he is invited. And he invites you to where he is. But if you don't want to come, he will not force you. Number 15. He has intelligence. I want you to type this in the chat. He is the intelligent spirit. He has intelligence. He is the intelligent spirit. Now I'm going to say something to you all. Please, for God's sake, stop speaking against intelligence. Stop making negative comments against people who are educated. It says something about your maturity in the spirit. I often hear some people when they preach, Oh, it's not about your education. It's not about your degrees. It's not about uh, uh, your schooling. Please keep quiet. He's the spirit of knowledge. He's the spirit of understanding. And he's the spirit of wisdom. And a part of expressing that is education. Who wants a dumb dumb to teach them the Bible? Raise your hand. Well, I know Reverend Robinjo didn't raise his hand for that. Let me lower Reverend Robinjo's hand. Who wants a dumb dumb to teach them the Bible? Who wants a dumb dumb to teach them anything? You want to know that the person who is teaching you the word is educated and intelligent enough to teach it to you. We're not talking about backabush communication. We're talking about having the ability to rightly divide the word of truth. The spirit of intelligence does that. So the next time you want to speak against the intelligence of believers, please shut your mouth. Please don't talk. And I'm serious about that. Because we are doing some things, making some statements that we think is, 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 is kosher statements. We think those statements are, are good to make because it sounds good. No, you have a deficit that you need to fix. Stop envying people and being jealous and covetous of people and their education and their intelligence by making lewd statements on the pulpit about their intelligence. He's an intelligent spirit. 
He is the spirit of intelligence. My God. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 10 to 11. Here is what it says. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. We are talking about the dimension of knowledge. The dimension of understanding. The dimension of intelligence. Let's go again to Isaiah chapter 40. And verse 13, who hath directed the spirit of the Lord or being his counselor has taught him? Uh oh, mm -hmm. spirit of intelligence, teaching brings intelligence. We have too many unintelligent Christians in the church, too many unintelligent believers who don't even know how to hold a conversation in the spirit. You start talking some deep things and they start looking at you like, huh? What? Huh? What is he saying? Blood of Jesus. You're rebuking what you don't even know. Mm. Because what? There is no intelligence. None. Acts chapter 15, 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost. And to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these things necessary. Is intelligent enough to know what to give you. Intelligent enough to know what you can carry and what you can't. That's how deep the intelligence of the Spirit of God is. He's not some spooky spirit. He's not some boogeyman. No. No, 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 no. What does the dictionary say intelligent means? Having or showing intelligence, especially of a high level. So let's look at what intelligence is. Well, let me, let me go in the phone because I want to break down this thing seriously. The ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills. A person with the ability to acquire and apply knowledge. The collection of information. My God. We need some people with the ability of the spirit. The ability to search things out. If you don't have no intelligence, you can't counsel people. With what are you going to use to counsel them? I am a firm believer in spiritual growth. You come in one way, but you don't stay that way. A seed does not remain a seed. A seed becomes a tree. That produces fruit that has seed to produce other trees. That produces fruit that has seed that produces other trees. Intelligence begets intelligence. And you can tell the much. Hey my God help me tonight Lord. Help me Jesus. Please shield me. You can tell the maturity of a church by the level of intelligence of its leader okay maybe you never heard what I said I will not repeat it I want to be your friends He is the spirit of intelligence. Let us stop making those sarcastic comments on the pulpit about people who are educated. 
it is good to be educated and anointed. The two go hand in hand. And education and intelligence are two different things. Edu education is the acquisition of information. Intelligence is the ability to apply it. My God, help us, Lord. Let us stop being sarcastic, man. Anointed, educated, and intelligent. That's who I am. And I do not apologize for that. I don't. I'm not going to despise people who have not had the ability to go to school. And I'm not going to insult people who had the means to go. Let's be balanced. Bring people up. How? In the Spirit, through the Spirit, by the Spirit, so that they can excel. The Spirit of excellence is one of the names of the Holy Spirit. But there cannot be excellence without intelligence. Excellence brings maturity. Or let me say maturity brings excellence. But intelligence precedes maturity. Let's apply ourselves to knowledge. Learn and learn and continue to learn so that you can give an answer to any man who asks you concerning your faith. Don't say to me, oh, prophet, I don't, knowing about Egypt, and Pharaoh and those things is not, that's not necessary for me. Yes, it's necessary. Because when you now get into a conversation with these black Hebrews, you can't have a conversation with them if you don't know nothing about Egypt. Learn as the Spirit of God directs you. It's not a case where you are ever learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. No, this is the Spirit of God leading you so that you can speak truth in every matter. Hallelujah. Number 16. He has a distinct personality. Very distinct. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 31 to 32. Let's see what it says here now. Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy which will be forgiven, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven, people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whosoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. This, this should shake us up seriously. This one should shake us seriously. What about the Holy Spirit? That it is so serious that God says, if you blaspheme Him, if you sin against Him, there is no forgiveness for that. That's a serious thing. It tells you something about the Spirit. And first and foremost, He's holy holy he's not the spotted spirit he's the holy spirit whether in this age or in the age to come he remains holy he cannot he cannot be tainted contaminated soiled solid never he remains holy, pure, forever. And when you speak against Him and sin against Him, it's a direct offense against His person. 
Mm -mm. Dangerous business here. That's why we need the fear of the Lord. He's good. He cannot be anything but good. Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 20. You gave your good spirit to instruct them and withheld not thy manna from thy mouth and gave them water for their thirst. He is the good spirit. If you know how to give good gifts, how much more the Father will give the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Father will give that which is good. The ultimate good is to receive the Holy Ghost. Oh my God. Galatians 5, 22 to 23 talk about the fruit of the Spirit. And a part of that fruit is goodness. He is good. Romans chapter 1 verse 4. He's holy. Holiness is a distinct personality trait. Paul, a servant of Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel, which was promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. You see how the Bible describes the Scriptures? It is not just the Scriptures. It is the Holy Scriptures because it was authored by the Holy Spirit. Concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in the power according to the spirit of holiness. By his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible says without holiness no man shall see God. Purity is a prerequisite to enter heaven. No man is going there without their pure. Without being pure. And the only way to be pure is by the spirit of holiness through the blood of Jesus Christ. He is the spirit of truth. John 14 verse 17. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. This is why you get offended when we speak truth. Because you are fleshly. You are in the world. If you are a kingdom citizen, you will not be offended by truth. You will be corrected by it. Big difference. People of the world get offended by truth. Hmm. Uh oh. I'm really touching on some serious matters here tonight. Next time you get offended because I told you the truth, ask what spirit are you of? John 15, 26, But when the Comforter is come, I will send unto you from the Father even the spirit of truth. He can't say anything but the truth. If you ask the Holy Ghost to speak, He's going to speak the truth. If you ask the prophet to come, don't expect the prophet to come and massage you. He's going to tell you the truth. That's why people don't like prophets. That's why people don't like true prophets. Because when they come, they rub you the wrong way. Because they are telling you the truth. And the truth offends. Because the truth offends your mind to, re to reveal your heart so that you can be corrected and become aligned by the Spirit of God. My God. He's the spirit of grace. Of how much sore a punishment suppose he shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant where he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. He is the spirit of grace. Grace is a direct character trait of the Holy Spirit. Zechariah 12 verse 10. I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. The ability to pray is the grace of the spirit. Prayer is a direct function of the grace of God. It's God's grace in a man. Not your talent. Not your um, educational ability and way with words. No. It is the grace of God. Ask for it. It's a direct trait of the Holy Spirit. You see why I tell you, ask for the Holy Spirit? Because when He comes, He comes with all of this. 
comfort is a direct trait, a distinct trait of the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26 is the spirit of comfort. John 15, 26 is the spirit of comfort. And then Galatians 5, verse 23 to 24. Patience, gentleness, joy, peace, kindness, faithfulness, self-control. Self-control. These are direct traits of the Holy Spirit. Now, the personality of the Holy Spirit is distinct from the Father and the Son. And although they are the same and they share the same attributes, there is a slight distinct in the Holy Spirit. They share all the same attributes and characteristics. But the Holy Spirit, you can know Him through His distinct traits. Sin against Him has no forgiveness. He is Holy Spirit. He can't be anything but holy. That doesn't mean the Father is not holy and the Son is not holy. They are all holy. However, it seems as if there is a line drawn concerning the Holy Spirit. To sin against Him is the point of no return. Now, personality. I gave you these personalities. Personality traits, sorry, that I gave you. When we talk about personality, it means that you will have a particular attitude, a particular behavior, a particular decorum, that when you see these unique things, we know that it is you. You can't mistake me for Pastor Diana. If you see Pastor Diana and call her Prophet Bernard, something wrong with you. I don't have a round face and long hair. Mm -mm. No. And I'm not woman. I'm man. I'm distinct. So when I turn up, you will know that it is me. When I speak, you will know that it is me. But how will you know? Because you have spent enough time with me to know how I operate, to know how I function, to know what I'm like in attitude and behavior. You know when I'm present and you will know when I'm not. You know when somebody is faking it and when the real deal shows up because you know people can act. But there are certain things about you that cannot be duplicated. Now, the personality of the Holy Spirit is passed on to us when He begins to dwell in us. We call this personality the fruit of the Spirit. This is what differentiates us from other people. Hmm. Now, let me get into this thing. Matthew chapter 7, because this is where the crunch is now. Matthew chapter 7, verse 16 to 20. Very important. Beware of false prophets when they come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. In other words, the spirit that is in them is not the Holy Spirit. Here is how you're going to recognize them. By their fruits. By their works. Are grapes gathered from thorn bush or figs from thistle? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down, thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. This is Jesus talking. Matthew 12 verse 33. I'm going to get into this. Let's hear the scriptures. Matthew 12 33. Same thing. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. The, for the tree is known by its fruit. You cannot be a believer. Hear me? And your attitude stinks. 
You cannot be a minister of the gospel and you have no self-control. You cannot be a prophet and you have no patience. Oh boy. You cannot be a pastor and you're not kind. You cannot be a Christian and you're not gentle. Oh, now I am touching your toes. Now I'm getting under your fingernail. The character of the Spirit is what causes people to know that we are Christians. People don't know you're a Christian because you speak tongues, which is speak tongues too. People don't know you're a Christian because you can prophesy deep and go deep, Papa, and, and prophesy forensic, whatever that is. No, even devils prophesy too. Your behavior, oh boy, your attitude and your decorum must fit the character of the spirit. If that is not happening, the Holy Ghost is not the one working through you. The Spirit of God dwells in us. And when His Spirit begins to dwell in us, then we begin to look like Him. The reason why the Spirit of God comes to dwell in us is so that we can have His attitude. It is possible for other people who are carrying demonic spirits to mimic powers of the spirit realm of the spirit realm it is possible i know this what sets us apart as christians is not the demonstration of power or the gifts but the fruit of the spirit demons cannot produce the fruit of the spirit demons no matter how hard they try to make you look like sheep they cannot make you become sheep whenever the holy spirit is at work through us listen to me very carefully and listen well because this will help some of you to be delivered Whenever the Holy Spirit is at work through us, He does not make us lose control or behave in erratic manners. Don't kick over the bench and tell me that you are in the Spirit. You are possessed. Don't tear off my button and tell me that the Holy Spirit led you. No, you need deliverance. Don't be rolling on the floor. Wiggling and jiggling. And tell me that you, you, the Holy Spirit came upon you and you lost. No, you didn't lose control. You need deliverance. I'm going to help some of you tonight. Love me or hate me. The word of God must be preached. Correction must be brought to the house of God. Because the way we are presenting the Holy Spirit is wrong. The Holy... My God. There is no such thing as I am not in control when the Spirit is upon me or I don't know what I'm doing. There is no such thing. There is no such thing thing i'm gonna explain some things to you follow me because this is where you are going to get the crunch of my teaching tonight the holy spirit is a gentle man not a boogeyman not a spooky man a gentleman a diplomat a king prince His behavior does not make us look spooky. Too many spooky behaviors going on in church that we are calling Holy Spirit. It is time to tear off the veil. It is time to rip off that cloth. I don't know where you got it, but it has to leave you. 
Holy Spirit is not spooky. And I see a lot of spooky behavior going on in church that we are calling Holy Spirit. No. He works through us to produce the work of God and the character of God. There are a lot of things that have infiltrated the church that we are calling Holy Spirit. That we are baptizing and calling it manifestation of, of the Holy Spirit. It is not. These are manifestations of demons. Now let me explain something to you. We know that these things are not the Holy Spirit because the behavior that is exhibited is not in keeping with the Spirit of God. Go read your Bible. Go look for every moment when the Holy Spirit comes upon a man. That man does not behave spooky. Ezekiel said he was caught by the lock of his ear. Did you see the Bible say Ezekiel was rolling on the ground, foaming at the mouth, moving his hand and beating up everybody around him? No. The Holy Spirit came upon Daniel and he was slain in the spirit. Do you see Daniel behaving as if he was possessed? No. Yes, Brother Cavell. Sinister and ghostly, spooky and boogie in a way that causes fear and uneasiness. Yes, bam, yes, so it is. These works, these operations, these manifestations that we are baptizing is not the Holy Ghost. These are demons manifesting. And because you are not deliverance ministers, you don't know. So you are embracing these things, thinking that this is the Holy Spirit. There are a lot of African spiritual invasions that are directly from spiritist behaviors of shrines. Over the past few years, a lot of invasion has taken place in the church. A lot. Because we are calling people who are in cults, witches, warlocks, and their mystical operations, Holy Spirit. But because you have no discernment, you don't know that this is not the Spirit. And then you are adopting these behaviors when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to move through you, you now begin to adopt these behaviors to think that, okay, I must behave spooky for people to know that the Spirit of God is on me. No. I want you to remember this. The Holy Spirit does not make me lose control of myself. He's not a mad spirit. He's not the spirit of madness. There are some mad things that are happening in the church. Mad. Crazy. And we're calling it Holy Ghost. It's not Holy Ghost. You need deliverance. You don't have to demonstrate the spirit being on you by leaking over everybody. I'm going to explain some things. Whenever there is evidence of loss of control, whenever the Spirit of God is moving through us, it could be one of these five reasons that I'm going to give you. Take what is yours, leave what is not, and if you don't understand it, keep quiet until you do. Number one, the power of the Spirit has located an element in your life, in your soul, where you need deliverance. That's number one. <laughs> mm -hmm. There is something in you 
that the power of God touched that began to manifest. And so you begin to behave erratic as if you have lost control. Now remember this. I am speaking, earlier I spoke about control in a different manner. Now I'm speaking about control in another context. You don't lose control when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Because his manifestation, he does not want people to think that he's spooky spirit. No, he's not spooky spirit. He's spirit of grace, spirit of gentleness, mm -hmm. spirit of God. If you don't believe me, please use Jesus as your benchmark of manifestation and operation. Please, use Jesus. Model Him. Stop modeling things you see out there. Model Jesus. You know, because some of you have been so accustomed to when people get in the Spirit, they start screaming, they start kicking, they start rolling, they start thumping, they start doing all kinds of things. You think that, okay, I must do that too. When the Spirit comes upon me, you are learning by association. And because you have not had somebody who carries the spirit of excellence, intelligence, grace, and diplomacy, you have not learned otherwise. Maybe you were cultured in a spiritist movement. I'm getting there. Number two, you are immature. In handling the power of the Spirit. Immaturity because you are not discipled and mentored by people who are experienced in the operation, manifestation, and fruit of the Spirit. Immaturity breeds immaturity. Immature, hey, my God. Immaturity cannot breed maturity. We have a lot of immature ministers out there. They don't know how to handle the power of the Spirit. You don't give a child a gun. He will shoot himself or shoot somebody else. You don't buy a child a car. Even if he knows how to drive, he's not mature for the road. So if you are going to pray for the Holy Spirit to use you, please, for God's sake, come to Bible studies so you can be discipled. It's your duty to apply yourself to discipleship. Number three, you were cultured in a spiritist movement or have spiritist foundation. You need deliverance. Some of you are coming out of revivalist churches. You have revivalist foundations. You were baptized in revivalist, at revivalist altars. Revivalist spirits were transferred to you when, when hands were laid on you. And so now, when the real Holy Ghost shows up, that spirit in you start manifest. It's not Holy Spirit manifesting. Holy Spirit manifests through the gifts of the Spirit. We're going to talk about this. Please, our teachings are going to get deep. You need deliverance. If every time the atmosphere becomes charged with the presence of God, you lose control. You need deliverance. 
Oh, Jesus, help me. Listen, I am not picking on anybody. I am not throwing stone at no one. I am correcting a spirit that has entered the church, for God's sake. And if you need correction, take correction. Because we have to speak truth in this hour. A lot of you have been infiltrated by spiritism. When spiritism is in operation, erratic behavior is commonplace. You think you have to jump around the altar, run around the church? You think you have to stand up on the bench, drop on the floor and roll? You think you have to chop with your hand and all kinds of stuff? Mm -mm. The presence of God does not make me lose control of myself. Now let me take you to the scriptures. Because you'll say, Prophet, prove what you're saying. Moses stood before the Shekinah glory of God. Fire, light, glory, thunder, lightning, word. What happened? Did Moses lose control? And run down the mountain and start ball to Jethro and say, Whoa, Lord, help me. Me dead now. No. He fell to his knees. Did he take up a stone and throw at the bush? No. He fell to his knees. And he said, Here am I. Very much in control of himself. And when the power of God came on him, Moses was so powerful in the spirit that even before the man speak, his words were being fulfilled. Now that's a prophetic dimension I want to reach. Never lose control. We are confusing being slain in the spirit because of the weight of the glory with Rolling and tumbling and wiggling like snake. Please, you need deliverance. Will the deliverance ministers rise up? You don't go hugging up that spirit. No, you go casting it out. Come out of him in the name of Jesus. Come out. I remember this apostle. She called herself Apostle. And when she called herself Apostle, well, I respect her. She's Apostle. She says she's Apostle. I respect that. High office. Glory to God. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Sitting there all holy, baptized in lime juice and sour sweetie. Looking at me when I was teaching about deliverance. As if I didn't know what I was saying. As if what I was saying is, is far from the truth. I said, well, I see that one, I ain't paying that one any mind. So, when time came for prayer, I said, let us stand. We are now going to pray. I lifted my hands. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I welcome your presence in this place. Boom! Apostle on the ground. We don't even start praying. Apostle on the ground. I'm not boasting, please. I'm not boasting. This is not a boast. I'm just using this, using this as an example. Apostle is on the ground. Ah, gah, and all kind of sound coming out. So I said to the pastor that invited me, I said, that one. I said, who that one? He said, prophet, that one, the apostle. Eh? I said, the apostle. And I continued praying while that one is rolling on the floor over there in the corner and going on. And then I couldn't take it no more. I went over. And I said, now in the name of Jesus, come out of her. And went to 
administer deliverance through the Spirit of God. When Apostle came back to her senses, Apostle sat down. She was now no longer on her chair of pride and arrogance and ego. And she asked me now, um, Prophet, what happened to me? I said, well, you were going through deliverance. She said, but I didn't know that was in me. I said, well, the Holy Spirit knows what is in you and he knows what to remove. And she said she's not coming back to the conference because that should have not happened to her. should have never happened to her. So, well, that, that's your choice, you know. But when I looked at the woman, the woman looked spooky. Honestly speaking, she looked spooky. Head wrap up and tie up. The only thing left was two, two pencils to go inside there. I said, well, I know what kind of spirit this one is of. By the way, she dresses. You understand? Mm -hmm. Serious, serious thing I'm telling you. You see, we have, we have allowed some things into the church. Spiritism and calling it Holy Spirit. So now when the real Holy Ghost turns up and things start happening, then people now become embarrassed. Why should you be? Why should you be if the Holy Spirit, if the real Holy Ghost is with you? Why should you be? He doesn't embarrass people. He doesn't do that. Especially if you are appointed to a high office in Jesus. Can you imagine your pastor going through deliverance while he is supposed to be taking you through deliverance? Can you imagine these things? One of the things I practice as a minister is that I don't pray for pastors, leaders publicly. I prophesy to them. But when it comes on to deliverance, I don't do it publicly because I don't want people to look at them in certain ways. If the Holy Spirit begins to deal with certain issues that are in them, because people can lose respect for you. Come on. I'm not here trying to shame people. I, I want you to, to get the real Holy Ghost. To know when he's moving. To know when he is the one operating. Different from when a demon is, is, is manifesting. Or when somebody's emotion is at work. Here is the next one, number four. We're talking about evidence of loss of control whenever the spirit of god is moving through us why does this happen number four you are too emotional enthusiastic excited and expressive in other words you are fleshly and unsanctified flesh cause you to behave erratic you can express emotion without losing character and control that is true maturity Some of you have not yet been sanctified from the flesh. You are justified in the spirit, but not sanctified in the flesh. Too emotional. Way too emotional. The pastor is preaching, teaching. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Preach it. No, shut up and listen. Keep quiet and listen. Let it soak into you. Worship is happening. And before you know it, you are gone. Gone. Not gone in the spirit. Gone in the flesh. <laughs> Help me, Lord, tonight. I'm not talking about being stiff jacketed and can't open your mouth and sing and, 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 and dance in the Holy Ghost and all that thing. No, 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 no. This one just gone, gone. Start run like you see in bold. Gone in the flesh. <laughs> gone in the flesh. I'm telling you, in the flesh. Run through the door and gone. You have to hold him, grab him. Gone. <laughs> I'm telling you. Erratic behavior. Express emotion. 
and lose control. You're too emotional, enthusiastic, and excited and expressive. Come on, man. Put a grip on your emotion. You don't emotions don't control you. You control emotions. They don't control you. Mm -mm. And number five. Reason why you lose control. You need to grow in the fruit of the spirit. You have not grown. You have not grown in the Holy Ghost, in the fruit of the Spirit. Growth in the fruit of the Spirit is important. Very important. Let me tell you something, saints of God. You can be very anointed and demonstrating the gifts of the Spirit. And it's oozing out of you. But let me tell you something. If you are immature and lose control when the presence of God is working through you, people will eventually sideline you. Because they will look at you as a spooky man or a boogeyman. Mm -hmm. And they will not want you in their church. You can come, but you will not do anything. People will fight what they fear and what they don't understand. As a matter of fact, what people don't understand, they will fear. And what they fear, they will fight. Let me say it again. If the Spirit of God is manifesting through you with gifts and it's oozing out of you with power, if you are immature and you lose control whenever that manifestation or that upper let me not use manifestation whenever that operation comes people will eventually sideline you they will not want you around because they will see you as the spooky man or the boogeyman they will have you come but they will not want you to do anything because let me tell you this especially about pastors they have a reputation to protect and they will protect it they have a standard and they will keep it either you meet their standard or you are above it but if you are ever below it goodbye world i stay no longer with you this is fact this is real this is true are you hearing me, saints of God? The Holy Spirit is going to anoint you. He's going to gift you. He's going to empower you. Don't ever lose control. You're not the spooky man. You're not the boogeyman. You are the man of God. The woman of God. There's a certain level of standard, excellence, and decorum that comes with you. Once you name the name of Christ. When the Pharisees spoke about Peter, they said, this man has been with Jesus. Peter, before he met Jesus, was a very erratic man. He will chop off your ears without asking. And then when it cut off, he will say, oh, that was your ears. I was going for your neck. <laughs> mm -mm. We have to correct some matters here. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. The Holy Spirit is a diplomat. The Holy Spirit is king. He doesn't behave spooky and boogie. He's not a ghost that comes with fearful sights to make you afraid. No. He wants you to draw into him. Anything that is spooky, we run from it. If Jesus was demonstrating the power spookily, people would not gather together with him. One of the reasons we are given the indwelling of the Spirit 
is so that we can have the personality of God. Stop telling me that as a Christian, you don't have patience, that you're unkind, that you're brush, rash, and harsh with people. No! You need deliverance. Full stop. That spirit needs to come out of you. And if it's your flesh, it needs to be cut out. Whatever is causing you to behave like that as a Christian, you need deliverance from it. For I'm a new creation. A holy person. Peculiar. Set apart. Sanctified. Holy. Consecrated. Royal. Priesthood. Royalty don't behave ghetto. Did I say that? Yes, I did. There is a certain decorum that comes with royalty. Hallelujah. Let's conclude this. God made it possible for us to know, relate, and fellowship with the Holy Spirit. He must be taught. John 15, 26 to 27 and 2 Timothy 2 verse 2. Let's see what the Bible says. We're going to read the scriptures. Let me see if I can get there quickly. John 15 verse 26 to 27 But when the Helper comes whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness of me and you will also bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. The Holy Spirit must be taught. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. We must teach about the Holy Spirit. Because if we don't teach about the Holy Spirit, then other spirits will come in. We will receive them and think it is the Spirit of God. And these things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. We must teach about the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit must be sought after. 1 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 11 first chronicles 16 and verse 11 it says uh, seek the lord and his strength seek his presence continually we must continuously seek the holy spirit hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 let's get there quickly hebrews chapter 11 6 but without faith it is impossible to please him for he that cometh to god must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him holy spirit must be sought holy spirit must be worshipped hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28 to 29 let's see what that says hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28 to 29 my god Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. One of the names of the Holy Spirit is consuming fire. He ought to be worshipped, my God. He must be invited into our lives. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16 this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Invite Him in. Invite Him into your life. My God. And number five, He must be listened to, and He must be followed. John 16 and verse 13. My God, how be it when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. My God, for He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that He shall speak, and He will show you things to come. Without the Holy Spirit, brethren, our salvation is impossible, and our Christian walk difficult. We need Him to survive. He is the air we breathe. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. The Spirit of God. We can know Him. He wants us to know Him. And we must know Him with all our heart. Amen and amen.